Pederoff and Jay Barney for the 2020 uh, Distinguished Scholarship Award. That is not a misprint. It is a 2020 award. Uh, since we were unable to truly celebrate the award last year, I asked Margie and Jay if we could honor if them this year, this and we're so pleased that they agreed. Uh, this session is a must-see uh, for all interested in strategic management and the resource base view in particular. Um, here's the agenda. I'll talk as little as possible so we could hear from Joe Porak to illuminate the role and insight of the award committee. Uh, from Connie Helfat and Marvin Lieberman to give us their unique perspective from the inside. And of course, from Margie and Jay, who coordinated their behavior. Margie is gonna discuss the evolution of RBV and Jay will reflect on the future. Let me tell you a little bit about this award. It was constituted last year and conceived by the STR leadership as a sort of Nobel Prize for strategy. And it recognizes an individual or individuals that have either made a specific theoretical or empirical discovery, or have developed a core set of ideas that fundamentally advanced research and understanding in the field of strategic management. It's, it represents a discontinuity, a discrete jump in the evolution of science. It's noteworthy that this award is not a lifetime achievement award, although certainly this year's winners might qualify for such an award. Uh, in choosing among the nominees, the award committee uh, assesses how the development of the field would have differed if it did not have the benefit of the contribution. In instituting this award, it is the STR leadership's perspective that our field has evolved to the point where we can recognize such sharp contributions to our understanding of strategic management. Accordingly, uh, we should celebrate. So let's celebrate. So, um, Professor Margaret Petteroff is the Leon E. Williams Professor of Management Emerita at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Uh, she received a PhD in industrial organization from Yale University and has served on the faculties of the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern, as well as the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Margie's 1993 paper develops a general model of resources in firm performance in particular, she clarifies four conditions underlying competitive advantage. Uh, professor Jay Barney is a presidential professor of strategic management and the Pierre Lassonde Chair of Social Entrepreneurship at the University of Utah, David Eccles School of Business. He received a PhD from Yale University and served on the faculties of Fisher College of Business at Ohio State <coughs> University. Texas A&M University and University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Jay's 1986 paper emphasizes uh, that imperfect factor markets contribute to competitive advantage. Uh, whether competitive advantage might be sustained is the focus of Jay's 1991 paper where he identifies four factors contributing to sustainable competitive advantage. Uh, the STR division takes great pride in congratulating professors Margaret Petteroff and Jay Barney for this distinguished contribution. Um, congratulations to the two of you. I look forward to your comments very much. Uh, but let me now introduce um, Professor Joe Porak, uh, the George Daly Professor of right. Business Leadership. Thank you, Vicky. Great to have you on. Um, Thank you, Joe. Vicky. Great to be here. Hello. So, I, some, um, maybe we can mute. Todo mundo aqui nessa sala. Aqui minha câmera está desligada. Whoever that is, maybe Demo and Julia, if you could mute uh, the people that are unmuted. So let me introduce Joe Porak. Um, he's a professor at New York University. Joe was a member of the STR Awards Committee and can shed some light on how the committee considered Jay and Margie's case. Thanks, Joe, for helping us celebrate this important 
contribution. Oh, well, thank you, Tim. And thanks for inviting me to be on the committee uh, last year. And uh, on behalf of the committee and the other two members of the committee were um, um, Rita Katilla and um, Mary Tripsis. And um, there, are, are, there are certain assignments and service assignments that one has, uh, uh, AOM, uh, SMS, whatever. Uh, some are more pleasant than others. And I have to say, and I think I can speak for both Mary and Rita on this, that this was really an enjoyable assignment and one that um, even afterwards, even afterwards, we still talk about it a little bit uh, because we enjoyed uh, the intellectual exchange uh, so much. Um, I'm not gonna speak very much. Um, I think uh, uh, the contributions of Jay and Margie speak for themselves. I can say that, that this is an early, uh, this was, uh, this award is an early award in the sense that, um, uh, well, I should say not early, but recent, uh, recently developed award. And uh, therefore, there were certain amounts of uh, leeway to how do you define it in some ways. And um, one of the things about the Academy is that you tend to kind of uh, uh, honor individuals. And the way we started to think about this was that, you know, there are fundamental discontinuities in uh, the field, uh, and that these discontinuities are driven sometimes by a single person, sometimes by combinations, and that there are individuals who are, um, uh, in Brandenburger and Stewart's terms, they're added value in pushing a particular kind of discontinuity and making it happen, um, are particularly valuable, and their added value is quite high. And that's the way we started to think about this, particularly because um, we uh, really wanted to recognize the RBV in some way. And we picked up off of, uh, Jay, Jay wrote this piece in um, Academy of Management Executive on um, the uh, internal analysis of firms. And he makes the point there that strategy, the, the field of strategy has sort of revolved, it's sort of rooted in uh, old SWOT analysis. And I was happy that Bill Guth, my colleague, my, uh, late Bill Guth, was honored by the, the, the division a couple of years ago for his work there. Um, but that the SWOT analysis kind of developed um, uh, or moved into a couple of different directions, more systematic structural analysis of markets. Um, and then uh, as uh, in the uh, early to late 80s and early 90s, and then uh, to begin to understand um, what, what it is about firms that m make them different and heterogeneous and, and industry heterogeneity and the resource-based view kind of developed. And there were lots of papers around uh, the mid to late eighties and early nineties on the topic, um, but we concluded uh, very, uh, very easily and without any debate at all almost that uh, Jay and Margie together uh, individually and sometimes collaborating um, were uh, you know spearheading uh, this uh, uh, this uh, perspective, and spearheading it in a way that kind of not only links it to uh, underlying theory, uh, but also makes it um, managerially. And we're, 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 this is the strategic management division makes it managerially accessible and gives uh, a real uh, a thrust to. Um, strategic management, uh, strategic management, uh, as opposed to, you know, broad conceptions of heterogeneity in general. So we're very happy to um, have uh, settled on Margie and, and Jay as uh, the first award winners. And um, we look forward to, uh, there's a lot of folks, some on the panel, in fact, who uh, may be next in line for this, but uh, there's a since it's such a recent award, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. And by that, I mean, people whose contributions to the field of strategic management are so obvious as to be yes, uncontrolled. As, 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 as to be, you know, just uh, so obvious uh, to be qualified for the award, but uh, that's for other committees, for future committees to, to think about. And, but uh, congratulations to Margie and Jay very much. Uh, we respect your work tremendously on behalf of the committee. I think you're muted, Tim. You're muted. 
Thanks so much, Joe, for helping us celebrate these two. Uh, and we want to hear from Connie and Marvin. Uh, which one of you wants to go first? Maybe Connie? Uh, actually, I think Marvin's slides would be best to go first because mine sort of dovetail after okay. this. Perfect. Okay, let me go then. Do you? Can everybody see my slides? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks for giving me this opportunity to honor Jay and Margie. Uh, Connie will speak mostly about Margie, and I'll speak mostly about Jay. Okay, so one reason Tim asked me to do this is because uh, both Jay and I have gray hair to the extent we still have our hair. Uh, and in fact, I noticed that we were both born in the same year. We started our careers, obviously, at the early days of the strategy field. And as fewer people know, we've both been shaped by the research environment at UCLA, although we didn't actually overlap at UCLA. Jay started his career as an assistant professor at UCLA in 1980, coming from a PhD program in sociology at Yale. I finished my PhD a couple of years later, ultimately arriving at UCLA in 1990. Uh, by then, Jay was gone, but as I'll show you, uh, Jay did his pioneering work on the RBV as an assistant professor at UCLA between 1980 and 1986. Oops. I'm going to emphasize Jay's uh, UCLA connection and also give you a taste of what was happening in strategy back in the 1980s. Uh, that's a time that relatively few in the audience will remember directly. Uh, obviously, Jay's intellectual contributions have greatly shaped the strategy field in the subsequent decades. Uh, but as you'll see, Jay was also influenced by intellectual currents that were taking place in strategy uh, and in economics four decades ago. So to prepare us, ourselves for this journey back in time, let me point out that in a world of perfect markets, there's no role for strategy. The perfect competition and free entry, firms can't make sustained profits. Sustainable profits require market imperfections. But that raises the question of what kind of imperfections? Uh, which are more important for strategy? Imperfections in product markets or imperfections in factor markets? Okay, let's take our journey back in time going even further than the 1980s, back into the 1970s. Uh, and as Joe mentioned, I'm going to expand on some of the things that Joe indicated. Uh, in the beginning, there was SWAT. Uh, this was Harvard Business School back in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, where there was the beginning of an intellectual development, but it was all uh, based essentially on SWAT. And I remember uh, one day meeting one of my advisors after class, uh, Mike Porter, uh, who came out of, of the classroom very frustrated and said, to me, Marvin, you know, every day is the same thing in class. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Uh, we've got to find a better framework. And of course, Mike was working on this at that, at that time. This is back in the late 1970s when Jay and I were both graduate students. Um, so just to give you some background about economics at that time, there were two schools of thought uh, in industrial economics. One was the Harvard School and the other was the Chicago School. Now, the Harvard School, which was based on, on the Bain-Mason paradigm, uh, believe that product markets are imperfect and such imperfections can be a source of sustained profit. On the other hand, you had the Chicago School that believe that product market imperfections are rare, that firms are heterogeneous, and that superior firms earn sustained profit. So profit comes from firm heterogeneity, superiority, rather than market power. Um, we still have these, as I'll show you, these two themes continue today. But back in those days, um, Mike Porter leveraged the Harvard School view into the five forces and wrote his book, Competitive Strategy, in 1980, which obviously has had enormous impact on the field of strategy. So, so Mike uh, emphasized product market imperfections. And on the other hand, we had the Chicago School, which was, you know, Still, uh, still is quite prevalent, um, emphasizing you know, firm heterogeneity and superiority. But the Chicago School economists didn't look inside firms. 
Uh, if you're an economist, your main concern is about antitrust policy. You don't need to know exactly where the superiority comes from. But in Chicago West, which was UCLA, there was a group of economists at this time, Armin Alchian, Harold Demsitz, Ben Klein, that were beginning to unpack this sort of organizational economics. And in the business school, in the strategy group, uh, were a number of scholars, including Bill Ochi, Bill McKelvey, and Dick Lamelt, who were also, from a strategy standpoint, uh, putting these ideas together. And into this intellectual cauldron comes Jay Barney. Jay comes with a degree in sociology. I can only imagine what it would have been like at that time to, to enter this group. Uh, people, people actually warned me about going to UCLA for a number of reasons uh, in 1990 when I went there because it was such an intense culture. Um, but Jay uh, managed to write some really important papers um, at this time as, as uh, has been mentioned by, by Tim and, and Joe. Um, the Strategic Factor Markets paper came out at that time. There was an important paper on organizational culture, which Jay published in both of these in 1986. Um, Jay's view, uh, you know, unlike Mike Porter, uh, it's not product markets that are imperfect, it's factor markets that are imperfect, and such imperfections can be a source of sustained profits. Now, uh, it turns out that, that the original title of Jay's 1986 strategic factor markets paper was Why Michael Porter is Wrong. Now, Jay went on to write what is now, I think, his most cited paper, over 80,000 Google citations, this Journal of Management paper, um, which came out in 1991, but the first draft was written at UCLA in 1984. It took seven years to get this paper published after being rejected by the SMJ and, and by AMR. Um, I think that if there had been earlier recognition of Jay's tremendous contribution, maybe Jay and I would be colleagues together at UCLA today. It certainly would be, would be nice uh, if, if that would, would have happened. Um, so anyway, Jay went on you know, in the subsequent decades to, to publish uh, lots and lots of, of important papers. Um, in general, you know, Jay's work on factory market imperfections provides a key foundation for the RBV today, maybe, maybe the, the key foundation, you might say. And I haven't talked much about Margie, but Margie's SMJ paper in the early 1990s uh, provided a clear explanation about how all this leads to rent generation. I remember reading Margie's paper and, and saying, wow, um, it's, now I, I fully get it. It's so clearly written, um, at least from the standpoint of an economist, this makes perfect sense. Um, so, so Margie really, I think that, paper of hers really crystallized all of this uh, for many of us. And, you know, in a nutshell, you know, what makes factor markets imperfect? It's essentially that firms are heterogeneous bundles of resources with complementarities, with organizationally embodied capabilities. And because we've got these bundles of resources that, that are complementary with each other, uh, the resources have more value inside the firm than outside. And so, so if you take them outside the firm, you know, resources have reduced value if they can be transferred at all. So you, so you, might, you might call this sort of you know, asymmetry rather than, than, than market imperfection, uh, but, but either way, it's clearly about factor markets. Uh, so let me just close by, by coming back to my early question, you know, which imperfections are more important for strategy? Imperfections in product markets or imperfections in factor markets? Mike Porter? or Jay Barney, the two most cited scholars in the field of strategy. Uh, obviously, both of these clearly matter, but I would argue that the huge outpouring of work on the RBV in recent decades speaks for itself. Uh, so let me turn it over to Connie, who will say more and, and focus uh, specifically on Margie's contributions. Okay, let me first say what a pleasure it is to be here. Uh, I, I think I have the pleasure of doing this because Margie and I grew up together <laughs> in many ways. Uh, some of you don't know, we went to graduate school together at Yale. Uh, we ended up at Northwestern for four wonderful years together. Um, 
together with some other people, including Rafi Amit, who is here. I'm so happy he could come. Uh, so with that, let me share my slides. I'm going, the reason I thought it would be great for Marvin to go first, because he gave you guys more um, details on what economics was like at the time. And what I'm gonna do is I'll say a few words of that, but I'm really gonna dig into sort of what the RBV was doing at the time and where Margie fit in in particular, since my job is to talk more about Margie, but also Jay. Um, so, um, and I'm also really pleased that there's some other really key contributors here to the RBV. I would actually mention Joe Mahoney, who I see in the audience, um, but I'm gonna talk about some other people. So with that, let me share my slides. Uh, okay. Okay, so here we are honoring Margie and Jay. Uh, so, um, so one thing about the RBD that I think is really quite notable that Joe alluded to is, you know, as an applied field, you know, strategic management often draws on theories that have developed in other fields, right? And then apply some strategic management questions, usually with a new twist, we get new answers, which is typical in any applied field, right? But what's really unique about the resource-based view is it's a homegrown theory from our field. It's one of our few homegrown theories. And as Marvin alluded to at the end of his slides, arguably one of the most important, right? So if we think about the evolution of the RBV, the way I see it is the early days where there are publications in the mid eighties that were really key. And these were obviously written before, well before they got published as you saw with Jay's management science piece on strategic factor markets. There's Berger Wernerfeld's piece that sort of coined the term in SMJ in 1984, and then Richard Remelt's really key work in the Lamb book, and also with uh, Lipman in 1982, the Bell Journal on causal ambiguity, other isolating mechanisms. And then we get to sort of what I would call the formative years, where there were really key articles that came out that really allowed the theory to progress and were fundamental and in this. Um, so I call that from the late eighties to early nineties, early to mid nineties. Um, so Margie's paper, obviously in SMJ in 1993, which I'll talk about Jay's JOM paper. There are other key ones, uh, Cynthia Montgomery and Berger Wernerfeld's Rand journal piece on diversification, all based on resources. Rafi's really cool paper with Paul Shoemaker and SMJ. Um, which brought in the more behavioral aspects of this and cognition. He had Derrickson Cool on the difficulty of accumulating assets quickly, and this took time in management science. He had Joe Mahoney's work in SMJ really laying out a lot of the historical um, ties and how this culminated in understanding resources. You had Ramel's work in SMJ on does industry matter, an empirical piece that really showed a lot of uh, the returns came at the business unit, which directed attention to resources. And also you had the work of Harrison Hitt Hoskinson in Ireland in the JOM special issue in 1991, where they started thinking about M&A. So I view these as some key pieces. I obviously couldn't put everything here. But that's the basis for you know, what you see today, in my view. It really took off in the mid 90s. Um, and I, th I think, you know, as, you know, as Marvin alluded to, the resource base view does rely on economic principles, but really with a uniquely strategy approach. And it's clearly not the econ that most people in strategy were using at the time, right? That was IO economics, industry structure, conduct performance. That's sort of the basis for Porter's five forces. And I would say that rents from assets and inputs were not on the radar screen, except for RBB researchers. And they surely were not on the radar screen in economics where the firm still is a black box largely, right? Um, this should, and as Marvin said, the Chicago school wasn't thinking about what went on inside firms that might make them difference and give sub firms rents. So what Margie did in her really seminal 1993 SMJ paper was that she realized there was nothing that did chapter and verse on the economics of rents to resources. And this is actually a really complicated issue. What is a Ricardian rent? What's a quasi rent? 
what's the relationship between them? I remember scratching my head going, how does this work? You know, how do they interact with monopoly rents in the output market? Where's competition anyway in all of this, right? So, and answer these questions, they're not written out in some econ class, right? I mean, in fact, if you're lucky, they might mention Ricardian rents in your economics training if you get some, right? So what I think the genius of Margie's piece was is to lay out in detail the economic logic that underpins rents to resources and the RBV while making this incredibly complex stuff seem simple and straightforward, right? It was really amazing, right? And that is why, in, in my view, it provided one of the foundational building blocks of the RBV, as Marvin said, right? And it complemented the foundational principles that were laid out by Jay in his 1986 and 1991 papers. Uh, and this and their subsequent work on the RBV is why we're honoring Margie and Jay. And I like to call attention to one paper that they wrote together in Managerial and Decision Economics in 2003 that tied the RBV to value creation and capture. Yeah. So Margie's going to talk a, a quite a bit about Northwestern in the early 1990s and late 1980s, which is where we were together uh, and when Margie was writing this piece. Um, but I'll just say a few words. Um, so uh, Cynthia Montgomery and Berger Werner felt were there with us, along with Rafi, Amit. And, you know, the mantra was resources, 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 right? And, you know, I remember going to lunch. So we used to go to lunch almost every day. Cynthia, Berger, Margie, me, often Rafi. And we would talk. And we often talk. I mean, sometimes we chit chat about our lives or whatever else is going on in the school. But a lot of times we talk about research. This is an amazing environment, right? And when you're junior, it was an amazing mentoring opportunity. Um, but I remember coming back from lunch one day and standing with Cynthia talking right outside my office. She started going on and on about something called the resource-based view of resources. And I had no clue what she was talking about. All right, and my initial reaction, which I did not say to her was like, what the heck's a resource anyway? I mean, this is not a term used in economics, right? But it obviously got me thinking, I mean, you couldn't not, right? Um, uh, particularly if you were someone with economics background who was interested in firms, right, as opposed to markets, right? But I would say that, you know, this notion of resources and Cynthia and Berger, they really had an outsized effect on the worldviews and the research of those of us at Northwestern at the time, right? So that includes Margie and Rafi, who wrote, you know, really stellar foundational pieces, and of course, on the rest of the field. Um, so, you know, if you think about the RBV today, right, look at the huge range of topics, right? So diversification and resource relatedness. Um, you know, you think of that's what Cynthia and Berger's work was in the, in the RAND Journal. Jay had a piece on this very early on in SMJ talking about synergy and you needed the resource fit. Um, you know, we had alliances with Harbir Singh and Jeff Dyer really bringing in the resource-based view. Market entry, um, you know, I'm, I am rather fond of my paper with Marvin on pre-entry resources and capabilities uh, as a precursor of success or failure. Um, and knowledge and innovation, I view as sort of um, very important resource knowledge. So you think about Bruce Kogut's work and Rob Grant's work. And so I do think this is sort of part of the broader uh, RBD. Human capital and employee mobility. I mean, human capital, you have Russ Koch who is here, which is wonderful. You have Raj Sri Agarwal's work. Again, you know, these are resources, human resources, right? There's a lot of work on, um, you know, top management and corporate governance from this perspective. Uh, I, I would call it Mike Hitt and David Sermon. Um, and then work on stockholder uh, stakeholders uh, beyond shareholders and their role at the RBV. And there's um, you know, early work by Russ and now newer work by Jay and Bob Hoskinson. And then we bring that brings us to the issue of rent appropriation, right? Not just the creation. So that is Margie and Jay's work, but also Russ's work. So um, <clears throat> obviously this is just a really brief summary 
But I think um, if you think about what's going on today, I, I view the RBV as sort of having a taken for granted character, right? It's almost a barely stated motivation for many, many studies and strategy, right? Um, sometimes people do mention it. Was, oh yeah, right, this is what's behind my work. Um, and, and we know that it, you know, the RBV's gone into marketing and operations in particular, right, as well as other fields. Um, as, and there are great papers there. And then I'd like to call out, I mean, there's new work. I know there's um, an issue in the Journal of Management that's coming out. Um, there's also going to be a new, I'd like to you know, toot our horn here, SMJ special issue on new directions for the RBD. That'll be published next year. And Jay's one of the editors, uh, which we're very fortunate about. So um, I think there's lots more to come. I'm really excited. And I think we, I feel like I owe a big thanks to, to Margie and Jay for getting us started on this path. Thank you both, um, Marvin and Connie. Your, uh, your perspective is wonderful and important because you were right there with them and um, really appreciate that. And Joe, for your uh, inside view of the awards committee. Okay, I, I think um, it's probably time to hear from the award winners. Uh, Margie, uh, you're gonna go first. She's gonna talk about the evolution of RBB. And I am sharing her slides, so let me do that. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I, let me just uh, give a quick thank you to um, Joe and Marvin and Connie um, <clears throat> for your terrific um, remarks, uh, both looking forward and, uh, and your gracious um, remarks about us, so thank you. And I wanna say hi to everybody out there uh, who's joined this session. I'm so sorry that we can't be all together in person. I would love to see, love to see so many of you, um, but I'm delighted nevertheless that you were able to join this, um, this session, be with us remotely. <clears throat> so when Jay and I first learned about this award, we decided that I would talk about the past. I'd do sort of a history of RBD thought and he would talk about the future and hence the slide. But before long, I realized that this topic had already been covered and very well indeed, uh, first by Jay and Asli Arakan in uh, 2001. And then more recently by Jay alone, um, there's a forthcoming issue of the Journal of Management that is uh, commemorating his 1991 special issue on the topic. And uh, so between those, I decided that instead uh, I should just talk about um, my more personal history with this particular topical domain. So this begins, <clears throat> as was already mentioned, by, uh, with my time at Yale as a graduate student in the economics department. And uh, Yale at that time, I thought it was unique. We tended to ignore Harvard um, because <laughs> there was a big rivalry as many of you know, but um, <clears throat> In contrast to the Chicago School of Efficient Markets and Rational Expectations, which was all the rage at the time, Yale was known for its heterodox approach to microeconomics. And this approach gave considerable attention to the phenomenon of market failures and their implications for organizational outcomes. And that very much shaped my thinking. For of course, a resource-based view begins with an assumption of market failures in factor markets. Um, that is to say, with resources and capabilities that are untradeable or imperfectly so. And now, consider the human resources and capabilities that were at Yale back then. So we have Dick Nelson and Sid Winter, who did early work on organizational capabilities and their evolution. These were both my professors. Sharon Oster, well known for her 1990 text on modern competitive strategy, was on my committee. Oliver Williamson was there. And while I never had him as a uh, professor, Professor Nelson made sure that we were well familiar with his work. And then, as Connie mentioned, I also had the good fortune to be studying with her there, quite literally, because we were in the same study group. And again, as mentioned, our time there overlapped just briefly with Jay's, but he was studying in the sociology department. So I don't think our paths ever crossed there, unfortunately. And then finally, Back then, believe it or not, there was no strategy course offered at Yale, not even in the business school. 
but Porter's 1980 book had come out and made a big splash and was very much talked about. And I was given the opportunity to design a seminar course for senior uh, Yale econ majors. And I decided to teach out of Porter's text and his case book. And that became my introduction to the field of strategy and why I ended up in the strategy department at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management for my first job in 1987. And that was also serendipitous for look who was in my department at the time. Cynthia Montgomery, Berger Wernerfeld, and Rafi Amit, three key figures who essentially led the department in terms of the intellectual climate. And then um, more luck, Connie was hired the same year that I was having spent some time first in California where David Teese became her mentor and co-author. And since much of Cynthia and Berger's well, work built on Teese's earlier work, it was almost as if Teese was there among us. And lastly, I have to mention Ed Zajac, not because of his scholarly work on the RBV, although he did publish a paper with Jay in 1994 in the subject, but because of his support for my work. I wrote my Cornerstones paper in 1989, and I had a terrible time getting it published. I sent it to Jay for his special issue in the Journal of Management, but the reviewers hated it. And Jay very kindly suggested that I send it to him again because he had just been made a senior editor at Organization Science. But once more, the reviewers hated it. Finally, I offered it to someone as a book chapter, but even there it was rejected. I was very depressed. Ed took me for lunch, <laughs> took me for two lunch. Um, I was ready to just put this paper aside forever, but he just laughed at me and he told me not to give up so easily on my work. And he encouraged me to send this paper to the Strategic Management Journal, where it was um, finally accepted with virtually no changes. So thank you, Ed. But now I have to turn my attention to two members of this group in particular. And they, of course, are Cynthia Montgomery and Berger Warnerfeld. In short, their influence on me and on the development of the RBV cannot be overstated. Connie's mentioned this and I just wanna say it again, it cannot be overstated. Here is a list of the papers published before my own that took a resource-based view of strategy, including Berger's paper that gave a name to the research domain. And I haven't even included here Cynthia's 1979 dissertation, which was resource-based in nature as well. But their influence on me personally went well beyond research. Cynthia taught me how to teach the core strategy course for the MBA students. And her course was really all about resources and capabilities, their power and their importance. And there was no way that you could have worked closely with these people and not have begun to have a resource-based view of the corporate world yourself. As Connie mentioned, resources and capabilities were all that we talked about and we talked about them all the time. Cynthia and Berger were chiefly interested in the topics of diversification and growth. They were following Penrose, Rommel with his 1974 book on the topic, and Teese, whose 1980 and 1982 papers in GIBO were particularly influential. But they also taught me that the topic of sustainable competitive advantage was the defining question in the field of strategy, and that resources and capabilities likely held the answer to this question. So this is the air that I breathed and the water that I swam in, but that wasn't all. Through my North, Northwestern colleagues, by seminars and conferences, I met many others interested in resources and capabilities. And, and here's just a partial list. These are those that I can clearly remember. My apologies if I've left somebody off here, but there's still quite a list as you'll see. At the Academy of Management meetings, I met Carl Kuhl, Rob Grant, David Collis, Kathy Eisenhardt, Shaker Zara, Avi Fiegenbaum, Bruce Kogut, Mike Hitt, Marjorie Lyles. At uh, the Kellogg School seminars, I met Dick Rommel and Jeff Williams, Marvin, Gary Pisano, Kim Clark, Todd Zenger, Rebecca Henderson, Anita Henderson, Henderson Anita McGann, excuse me, and Jay Barney. And then uh, at other conferences, particularly the Wharton Summer Conferences and the Illinois Strategy Conference that Joe Mahoney put together. Dan Leventhal, Joe Mahoney, Kate Connor, Laura Popo, Gary Hansen, Gordon Walker, and Denny Yao. Uh, and this is a list of only the folks that I met 
early on. There were obviously so many more. So it would be hard not to be influenced by all of this. And for me, the high point came in 1990 with a symposium that Jay and I organized for the Academy of Management meeting. So have a look at what was presented there and by whom. So here, Jay presented what became his 1991 Journal of Management paper. Rafi Amit uh, gave a prelude to his 1993 uh, paper with Shoemaker that Connie's talked about such an important paper. Cynthia presented her paper uh, with uh, Sam Harry Harron, who was published in Jibo 1991. David Teese presented his famous dynamic capability papers with, with uh, Gary Pisano and Amy Schuen. It wasn't published until 1997 in SMJ, but it was presented right here. And um, I presented um, an early version of my Cornerstones paper, the 1993 paper, and then Garth Saloner presented something on the value of game theoretic reasoning. I know it was consistent with the RBV. I can't recall much more than that, I'm sorry to say. But I do recall that at this session, there was standing room only. And at the time, Jay announced that he would be editing a special issue of the Journal of Management on the resource-based view. And that, of course, was the issue in which his famous paper was published, along with papers by Kate Connor, Connie Helfat with Richard Castanius, Marlena Fiol, and then one that Connie's mentioned by Jeff Harrison, Mike Hitt, Bob Hoskison, and Dwayne Ireland. So that was quite an issue. Um, an explosion of related work soon followed. And I'm not gonna read through this list, but you can see how dense this list is. And this just lists the papers that were published between 1991 and 1995 in the major strategy journals. It was huge. Also, um, it was reported that at the various strategy journals, such as the Strategic Management Journal, the AMJ, the AMR, Org Science, California Management Review, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, um, Journal of Management, of course, these editors were reporting that they were getting lots and lots of submissions on the topics of resources and capabilities, their attributes, their associated outcomes, and their dynamics. And I want to say that during this period, I want to give a special shout out to Dan Shendell, who was the editor of the SMJ and founder of SMJ, because if you look back at that slide and all those papers that I listed, you'll notice that the majority of them were published at the SMJ. And this was also true of the earlier period that Dan published um, so many papers, including that 1984 article by Berger Wernerfeld that gave a name to this domain. domain. Dan was known for his receptivity to promising new ideas. And without the encouragement that he gave to those who were working in this domain early on, I believe that the RBV would never become as important a perspective in the strategy field as it has become. So um, I wanna just look, give a little thank you there to Dan. Anyway, as you can see, there was clearly a wave sweeping over the field, which swept me up along with many others. And I'm grateful to have played a part in what eventually became so much more by continuing to engage scholars in the strategy field to this very day, as Connie's shown, and also by reading outward to influence fields as diverse as human resources, marketing, entrepreneurship, international business, operations, and more. Excuse me. Um, and I am grateful. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Yes, I am grateful, but what I want to emphasize is how much I owe to those who came before me and paved the way, including Dick Romelt, David Teese, Sid Winter, Carl Kuhl, Cynthia Berger, Berger Wernerfeld, and of course, Jay Barney, and how much I appreciate those who worked alongside me and supported me, including my other Kellogg colleagues, colleagues Rafi Amit, Connie Helfat, Ed Zajak, my co-authors in, in the RBV domain, and these include David Teese, Subi Lee Heaton, Connie Helfat, Kathy Maritan, John Mario Verona, Jada DiStefano, Marjorie Lyles, Mark Easterby Smith, Mark Bergen, Akshay Rao, Mark Shadley, Sid Finkelstein, Will Mitchell, Sid Winter, Harbir Singh, Harit Sukis, and Jay Barney, and many other friends who are too numerous here to mention by name. I would also like to thank the Strategic Management Division Awards Committee and also Tim Fulta and the other division officers and members of the executive committee, 
I'd like to thank Connie, Marvin, and Joe for their kind remarks, and all the members of the SDR division who've contributed to the building of this field and who have found value in my work. I am truly honored and humbled by this award. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. That was beautiful. Jay is out there as well, I believe. Hey, yes, I, yes, I am. I assume it, you can hear me. It's great to have you, Jay. We can hear you. Good. So uh, it's my turn. Uh, were you going to post my slides too, Tim? Oh, um, I can. Uh. <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can find them. Oh, Jay. oh hey there. Okay, hang on a sec. Great. Thanks, Margie. Thanks for everyone who's spoken. Uh, I uh, just wrote a list of this of, of the people I can see. I uh, I can't see everyone. I'm sure. Uh, who's on the call this morning, the Zoom this morning, and uh, Joe and Connie and Marvin, Rich McAdock, who's co-author of mine, Russ Koff, who, uh, Joe Mahoney, Rafi Amit, uh, Kathy Merritt, uh, these are all people who uh, have had a deep impact on my thinking, and, um, and many of us have worked together on various papers. It's been a lot of fun, and I appreciate it. Uh, my task was to talk a little bit about the future of resource-based theory. Um, I, I don't, do I have, there we go. Um, there's a um, quote, um, prediction is a pre precarious business. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. Allegedly, that's from Yogi Berra. It turns out, uh, who, for those who don't know, was a, um, a famous uh, catcher for the New York Yankees. This quote is actually from, um, just not working um, uh, Niels Bohr, uh, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, I think a little bit more uh, profound perhaps than Yogi Berra. So I'm not, uh, I'm not pretend to have any uh, particular uh, insights um, about the future of resource-based theory, building on some work I've done in the field of entrepreneurship that was important for me to remember is that research, the future of resource-based theory is not out there. This might be discovered by some unusually bright um, uh, academics that it is the process of being created by people like yourselves. Uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll know the future once we arrive in it. But in the meantime, um, it's very hard to predict how it will evolve. Uh, so rather than trying to make some general predictions, I just thought I'd talk about what I'm interested in doing these days. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, yeah, recently, uh, the uh, General of Management, it was mentioned briefly, has a special issue that I was a, a co-editor of um, where uh, we've invited, we invited um, authors from 18 different disciplines to talk about extensions and applications of resource-based theory, everything from international business to HR to organization management theory to cognitive psychology. It's, it's a fascinating you know, set of articles. So I'm gonna be focusing instead on what's interesting to me. Okay, so uh, what's interesting to me is, um, uh, is represented perhaps best in an article I published in 2018 in SMJ that um, suggests that resource-based theories model of profit appropriation must adopt a stakeholder perspective. It was a fun paper to write, it took about three years of uh, 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 revision and presentation. Uh, and one thing I one thing I like about it is that uh, it doesn't suggest that it might be a good idea for resource based theorists to think about a stakeholder perspective. It actually makes an argument suggests that it's a logical requirement of the theory um, that uh, that we have to in fact take a resource based perspective. Uh, it's it's really easy to, it's now, after all these years, it's easy for me to summarize the argument. The argument goes, basically firms cannot attract the kind of resources they need to generate economic profits through fixed claims or complete condition claims contracts. And so it follows if firms treat all their stakeholders, go back up one slide. If firms treat all their stakeholders except shareholders as fixed claimants, 
then they won't be able to attract the kind of resources they need to generate economic profits. Thus, to generate economic profits, firms must treat at least some stakeholders besides shareholders or residual claimants. And this is equivalent to saying that research theories, based theories model of profit appropriation must adopt a stakeholder perspective. The way I say it uh, now is really simple. Um, if we were to buy the argument, the only residual claimant uh, to a firm's profits or a firm's shareholders, um, this is the deal that that assumption makes to other stakeholders of the firm. So here's the deal. I want you other stakeholders, not shareholders, I want you other stakeholders, your employees, your critical suppliers, those people like that. I want you to take your resources and make them available. I'll pay you a fixed wage for these, a fixed fee for this access. I want you to make these resources available to my firm. And I want to see your dedication and loyalty, your commitment. I want to see firm specific investment. And I want you to work incredibly hard to help us generate economic profits, all of which we'll give to someone else, the shareholders. Why would anyone do that? It's crazy. This is a crazy assumption that we've found ourselves in. And in fact, uh, this paper suggests that it's unlikely that other people would do that, that any of these other stakeholders would do that. And if, and if you can't acquire access to, the to profit generating resources, uh, that you could then generate, uh, uh, then you can distribute to uh, um, shareholders as residual claimants, then that would be great. And then you don't have any profits to begin with. So in any case, so, um, so I write this article, but this article creates a whole bunch of problems because frankly, stakeholder theory has a whole bunch of problems. And, uh, and these are the problems that are interesting to me right now and that I don't have answers to. So these are the questions I'm trying to deal with right now. Okay, next slide. So um, first is uh, what the, it turns out that in the model, uh, it's very important uh, that there's a team production process that requires co-specialization across different stakeholders. That's where basically the rent generating potential comes from, I'll be following directly from Margie's work. Um, we have a fair amount of work in the literature on um, when stakeholders will make or will not make firm specific investments. Uh, we don't have, but that's not, that's, that's kind of a bilateral relationship. We don't have as much of work on the multilateral relationships that uh, we're talking about in a team production framework. We're not only making specific investments in the firm, but I'm making specific investments in perhaps multiple other stakeholders who are also making specific investments in the firm. And uh, that process, how that happens, when it happens, why it would ever happen, under what conditions, uh, Seems to me we, we don't know as much about that as, at least I don't know as much about it as I, as I like. Obviously there's difficult ex ante and, uh, contracting problems and ex post opportunism problems. Uh, although I don't think of it as strictly uh, a, only a transaction cost or even a contracting problem, but certainly that kind of logic will be important part of what we do. The second question that I think is not fully answered yet in this sort of resource-based slash stakeholder world is um, the question of firm boundaries. Uh, when will it be necessary to bring stakeholders from the boundary of the firm to create the co-specialization we're talking about? Um, it's also the case that even once we bring uh, a stakeholder inside the boundary of the firm, does that mean co-specialization will happen automatically? My experience is working in, in real companies is that in fact, firms would often rather work with outside stakeholders than they would with a sister division or another function within the company. Um, so co-specialization within the firm boundaries is not a trivial problem. I don't understand that process well enough and it's a challenge for us. This also brings up the whole question of the theory of the firm and strategic management. Um, if strategies about how economic profits are, are generated and sustained, and if economics can be generated through co-specialization among otherwise independent, independent factors of production, then is it really necessary to have a firm in our model to explain the generation of profits? What we need, I'm thinking, is maybe not a strategic theory of the firm, but a strategic theory of economic profit generation. And that may not necessarily require a firm. There's a bunch of work these days on ecosystem platforms and things like that. 
that suggest that in fact, rent uh, profit generation can occur without a firm as a central uh, point. So that's another possible thing to think about. The next and most obvious one in many ways is given that um, profits are gener generated through uh, co-specialized investments among complementary resources from stakeholder, different stakeholders, the question becomes, how do then are those, those profits then allocated to um, those stakeholders ex post? Um, we, th we think we know a little bit about this, but the problem of course, as we know, is that it's very hard to measure the marginal impact of a particular stakeholder on profits when there's co-specialization of this variety. You just can't do this as um, well-established in, in the economics literature. Uh, this is a hard problem because each stakeholder has a strong incentive to uh, inflate the claims of their impact. Um, firms, uh, these stakeholders may vary in terms of their stake, uh, their negotiating skills. It makes it complicated to know. And um, also, uh, stakeholders have to worry about not only appropriating profits in the current exchange, but also what co-specialization might mean for future exchanges. And so there's, the, so there's a whole bunch of quite complicated issues that have to be worked through to figure out how these profits would actually be uh, appropriate across uh, multiple uh, stakeholders. Next, next slide. The last is that this, this stakeholder um, perspective in resource-based theory really puts an emphasis on those stakeholders who, when they make co-specialized firm-specific investments, help generate economic profits. It maintains the distinction between those stakeholders who then could be treated as residual claimants and then um, um, fixed claimants who don't make those kinds of profit generating resources uh, to available to a firm. Sort of the standard logic in economics is those fixed claimants should be treated, uh, paid a, a market term in wage, then we should just move on. But I wonder if there are other moral obligations and other practical obligations that a firm might have to these fixed claimants that uh, don't make them residual claimants, but don't make them quite the interchangeable parts that, uh, that uh, sort of the standard fixed claimant theory would have us think about. So actually, I'm, 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 I'm actually working on papers to deal with all of these questions. I don't think I'll get them all answer here anytime in the near future. It turned out to be quite complicated and difficult, but those are kinds of the questions that are, um, that are, that I'm thinking about with regard to resource based theory right now. Next slide. So I also um, couldn't end uh, this kind of a session without thanking um, a whole bunch of people who made all this uh, possible. Um, Marvin, uh, did a great job of uh, talking about uh, the, my early days at UCLA. Um, um, so I, I arrived at UCLA having never taken an, an economics class or a, a, a business class. I guess I took two, a couple, a three or four business seminars in the uh, business school, PhD seminars in the business school. But so I was, a, I was to say that I was raw would be an understatement. Um, I, I like to. Re remember the, the very first time I was exposed to the intellectual capabilities uh, that were UCLA was uh, Bill Ochi organized a conference on the new institutional economics. Um, actually, it, it happened the spring before I started uh, at fall. So it would have been spring of 1979. And Bill was there, Dick Rommel was there, Bill McKill was there, but so was Armin Alchin and Harold Bensetz and Ar Oliver Williamson and David Teese. And, and I didn't even know what the difference between the new institutional economics and the old institutional economics was. So uh, I will say that I, I, be, I became uh, pretty well uh, versed in, in TCE during that meeting. I went back to Yale and talked to my management professors how I thought that transaction cost economics was gonna be a really important uh, theoretical framework going forward in the field. And they, they strongly discouraged me from doing anything in transaction cost economics. Uh, they, they were wrong. Um, uh, two, uh, two editors that played a very important role in my career um, uh, early on were Ari Lewin and Ricky Griffin. Ari was the uh, field editor for strategy at Management Science, where, my, um, <clears throat> where I had three reviewers on my uh, factory markets paper. Um, uh, uh, the first two reviewers hated the paper all five rounds. The third reviewer loved the paper all five rounds. And based on the fact there was such strong disagreement in at least one person who liked the paper, 
already accepted the paper, which is, that's what an editor is supposed to do rather than take a vote. So, uh, and Ricky Griffin was the other general management who was uh, very kind and gave me the opportunity to uh, uh, create the, uh, the special issue in general management, which I think was instrumental for a lot of us. My kid, Bob Hoskinson and Barry Basinger were important colleagues of mine at Texas A&M. Uh, they really helped me. Um, well, at UCLA, we had developed this highly specialized language that only, uh, only about four people in the world understood, but we understood things very efficiently that way. But uh, it turns out there was this broader audience in the management literature that we had talked to. And so uh, Mike and Bob and Barry helped me figure that out. Uh, Berger, Cynthia, Margie, Connie, David, and Ollie Williamson. These are all names that have been mentioned before. Uh, well, that's because they were, they were important, um, not just in the resource-based study, but bringing sort of a more economically oriented perspective into the field of strategy. Um, these are some of my students, Kate Rimmelt, Jim Robbins, Todd Sanger, and Bill Hesterly, who are both colleagues of mine now at University of Utah. Uh, Low Business at Texas a and Billy Tyler, Doug Miller, Allison Taimaki, Oslin Ilgaz, Eric Khan, uh, Naga, Janice Malloy, Matt Barlow at the University of Utah, Ryan Angus Mo Chen, who's uh, currently a student, former student of mine, who now is a PhD student at the uh, University of Maryland. And from these people, I learned a lot. Um, one final observation. Um, uh, Uh, none, none of, most of you don't know the costs. Well, probably you do, but a lot of people don't understand the costs of uh, when you uh, are focused as, as, as focused as I have been in my career. And it's only possible because of my wife, uh, Kim, uh, who uh, uh, kept it all together. And our three kids, she really raised the three kids, uh, Lindsay, Christian, and Aaron. And now we have 12 grandchildren. Isaac, Delaney, Chloe, Audrey, Lucas, Royal, Lincoln, Nolan, Theo, Kate, Towns, and Rye, aging from age 20 to age one. So uh, we keep busy with our grandchildren these days. And uh, um, uh, it's, uh, it's been a delight, uh, absolute privilege to work with all the people. Many of you are on the screen today and, and for whom I have deep affection. And uh, and uh, and uh, to help me provide a living for my family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. It's fabulous. Um, you're 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 reviewing history and I guess particularly in, in Marge, Margie's talk, it, it made me think about my PhD days when uh, guys like Michael Leibline and Javier Jimeno, Jeff Ryer were around. And Dan Schendel, of course, was there and he, Kathy Maritan, uh, uh, he was involved in the midst of this and, and he pointed us uh, in the direction of suggesting that this was the next big thing, the resource-based view. Uh, so uh, it was certainly exciting times for us, and uh, it's still exciting now. Um, but we have a little time, and it would be nice to answer some interesting questions. We have a unique opportunity with some wonderful panelists. So what do you want to know about the resource-based view and how it evolved and um, um, where it's going? Not sure if you can speak. Um, Kathy, can maybe you can try it out. Can you can you unmute yourself and, and talk? Sure. Um, okay, excellent. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just wanted to use you to see if, <laughs> if you can talk. But if anybody has a question, it would be wonderful to to interact with you. Yeah. Sorry, Kathy. Hello. I'll start calling on my Purdue colleagues. I know Javier is there somewhere. Rich, Rich Macadoc is there, right? Yes. Uh, what do you want to know about uh, the RBV? 
you know, uh, Carl Kuhl was, uh, of course, a pivotal player. And being from Purdue, we were extraordinarily proud to have Carl uh, playing a pivotal role. Um, so. But when I, if no one's going to ask questions, I'm just going to tell stories. Yeah. So okay. I can tell, the, can, I, can I tell the, I'll talk, start with the Rich Mackadoc story, if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, no. So. <laughs> so well, I'll just... uh, I'll, I'll, I will um, I will just repeat the comment that I put in the chat window, which is these are really the the, the most well deserved awards I've ever seen presented. Oh well, thank you, Rich. That's and congratulations good. to both uh, you and uh, and Margie J. Yeah. So, so Rich Rich wrote a paper that was highly critical of the factor markets paper, and gave it to me the Academy of Management, and I said thanks, Rich, and let me look at it, and I read it, and I I called him up. And I said, Rich, let me tell you why your criticisms are not valid. But you raise a really interesting dynamic question, which I was, was not addressed in 86. Why don't we write a paper together? So we did. And it turns out shortly after that, maybe two months after that, I uh, slipped and broke my ankle. I was walking the dog. It was very embarrassing. And, uh, and, uh, and so my wife suddenly, be, my office was downstairs and I, I couldn't move. I was in, laid up for like two weeks in my uh, bedroom upstairs. And so my wife became the intermediary. In, intermediary. And uh, those of you who worked with Rich probably may know this, but um, he's rather intense. Um, <laughs> and she finally came and says, who is Rich McAdock? And why doesn't he leave you alone? It was uh, quite, quite But that paper came out of management science. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, Rich, Rich, well, I see Joe Mahoney there. He was in the thick of things too, right? Yeah, I guess a, a question I have is, uh, what was it about, I, I was struck by the 1990 conference that Margie met. It was one of the first conferences I ever attended and I was thinking at the time, this is going to be a great career because every year it's going to be just like <laughs> 30 years. And so I guess the question I have, I have, if you have any insights about what was special about 1990, about how it all came together in a, in a, tr a tremendously exciting and energized way. And uh, I wish I could capture that in a bottle because, uh, and, ha and how can we regenerate that today? Uh, if at all, we can be a catalyst to doing that. Hmm. What do you think, Margie? That wasn't the only one, though. You know, I remember, I think, in 1992, Tease uh, presented that. There was, there was maybe, a, I think Kogut and Tease had a great session on dynamic capabilities. So that uh, that was another really energizing conference. Maybe it was because of our stage and our career, Joe. I don't know, but but yeah. Let me. What was it about that 1990 that was such a catalyst? You know, I don't know if it was a catalyst for everyone. I mention it because it was just so exciting to me. You know, I remember calling up Cynthia. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned. <laughs> It was resources, nothing but resources all along. And, but um, by then, Cynthia and Berger had both moved on to Harvard for Cynthia and MIT to Berger. And um, anyway, I was excited about the topic. It was largely due to them and the environment that they and Rafi and Connie and you know that whole department had exposed me to. And so I called up Cynthia and I said, you know, gee, I'd really like to, to organize a symposium on this topic, would you be willing to come? And she said, funny that you should ask because Jay had just contacted her for the same purpose. And so why didn't we work together? And although I'd met Jay before, he, you know, as I mentioned, had come to Kell the Kellogg School to, you know, give a talk. He talked about his culture papers, I recall at the time. But anyway, it was a great opportunity for me to do a little collaboration with Jay. Um, he was a big deal, I was not. And, uh, and to put this thing together. And then, you know, as I said, you know, you think about who was there in the papers that were delivered, they were extraordinary papers. It was an extraordinary time. There was obviously so much interest in the audience. Um, you know, it was, it, it felt like a little launching pad, but that was a personal experience to me. And I was just hopeful that it, 
uh, it felt the same way to others. Certainly there was excitement in the air. Mm -hmm. to, to me, so it was so important um, that uh, Mike Porter had laid the groundwork for bringing economics to the table. Um, I don't know if many of you had a chance to hear um, Don Habrick's description of what strategy was like in 1978 or 79 or something like that. And it was, I mean, it was not at all clear that it was going to be a field of strategy. I mean, it was, it was theoretically uh, not well developed. It was, uh, it was primarily a teaching discipline. I actually have um, the Academy of Management Proceedings from, I think, 1979, before I went, I just had to find one. And I looked at what was the BPS division, the BPP division, Business Policy and Planning Division back then, if you can imagine. And there were six articles published and half of them were on pedagogy, you know, the most effective way of teaching cases. Um, and so what Mike did was he, he brought a, a certain economic, brand of economics into, into the, and that created the opportunity for then more Chicago school oriented people to do the work. So, mm -hmm. so I think that the, part of the timing in 1990 was simply that the field had been exposed to uh, SCP kinds of thinking and then had worked it through to the point where it was time to go to the next thing. And, and, uh, and so our, our, we were very fortunate in, in timing wise. I remember being in a um, doctoral consortium in, uh, on the faculty in the sort of probably late eighties. And this will surprise anyone who's young in the group, but um, there were 30 doctoral students in the, in the, in the session and people asked, they were introducing their topics. And of the 30 people, 28 were doing something on strategic groups. <laughs> okay, you remember that? Yeah. Uh, it's just a, a strange, uh, it, so it, it, it had, to me at that, that my, when I saw 30 people doing the same dissertation topic, I knew it was time to get new topics. Okay. And so, uh, um, so the timing was, was fortuitous. Okay. Well, you know, Rafi Amit is, is with us, as we pointed out before. He's got a guest with him right now. But Rafi, it's, it's wonderful to, to have you, given all your contributions uh, to the RBV as well. Thank you for showing up. Oh, you're muted, I think. Yeah. Oh, still muted. No, sorry. He, he is unable to talk. Well, that's too bad. Rafi, uh, Rafi was at the Wharton conference with Margie and Connie and I can't, can't, can't think of anyone else who's here was there. And we, we still talk about the walk on the beach, right, Rafi? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, uh, this has been wonderful um, to let us honor you. It's been too long. I think it's been 20 months since you won this award. Uh, so it's about time we, we finally give it to you. I think you received it by mail a few, uh, a few um, of the last year, but there's nothing like getting together, whether it's virtual or whatnot, to celebrate and put some closure on, on that. Uh, so on behalf of uh, the division and our field, uh, I'd just like to extend our warm, warmest congratulations and gratitude for taking us uh, further than we were before. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Margie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks.